And I actually think the bear market was a very good thing that happened for the Web3 world. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of us lost a lot of money and it was very painful, but I actually think it was the growing pains. It was those teething issues that you have to go through. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. And today, my guest is Mariam Nosrat. I hope you guys are buckled on your seats to have a great trip because we have a person here with a huge CV, former founder and CEO of Breshna.io, the no-code game creation engine and platform. And she will talk about that, of course. She's a seasoned entrepreneur in the world of Web3, and she also won a prize at the Web Summit. And she even was invited at the Clinton Foundation on stage with former, with former President Bill Clinton. So that's quite a huge celebrity <laughs> we have here in the world of startups. Hi, Mariam. I'm happy to have you here. I got here. Thank you so much for that very warm, very kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to talk to you about all things Web3, Web2, Web2.5, 2.6, all of that. So excited to get into that. You know, I, I have a sweet spot for startups and for entrepreneurs, myself being one. Uh, but I also have um, a sweet spot for uh, what you're doing uh, at Breshna because I always sympathized with the guys who have a, you know, a rich mental universe and who like creating video games, but who are not really into coding. So that, that's typically why I'm super happy to have you here. So first question, what are you, um, what are you doing these days? What is the, the activity of, on your whole CV that takes the, the biggest amount of time in your week? A hundred percent. So Gautier, like you said, I'm the founder and CEO of Breshna.io. And Breshna is a no code game maker platform that allows people to make their own video games, no coding, no design skills, and at lightning speed. The word Breshna actually means lightning in the Pashto language, which is my mother tongue, I'm originally from Pakistan. So video games in less than 15 minutes, um, anyone can make their own games. Again, no coding, no design skills needed. It's almost like the Canva for video games, right? And one of the things that we're doing is not just changing how video games are created, but also how they're used. So we're saying you can make mini video games for education, social impact, marketing purposes. So if you wanna make like a Super Mario game where you, um, the teacher is like, hey, catch the even numbers and dodge the odd numbers, like Super Mario or something, or like catch all of the flags of countries from Europe and dodge everything else, or a Mythbuster game about Web3 or something. So anyone can make a game about the topics that they're passionate about, and they can distribute it as a simple URL link. So the big idea behind Prashna is what Canva did for design, what TikTok did for video, we're doing for video games. It's interesting that you used all um, all these examples that come from the world of education because I so I know you were an, an education specialist uh, at World Bank well, Group, um, and it's interesting because I I love learning languages and I see so many teachers using uh, basically very basic Kahoot question uh, questionnaires <laughs> forms and little games in order to recognize to well flip tiles and recognize words so we could find something which is even funnier um, for people at least for the fun part of languages and uh, is it possible to make other games with Bresna? A hundred percent so you can make your own scavenger hunt games your own racing games car racing games crossword puzzles jigsaw puzzles like you know it's like I mean maze games and everything it's like there's whack-a-mole there's wordle learn with letters so there's a bunch of there's actually 22 templates on Prashna right now that you can leverage and make your own video games and we keep adding templates and we're actually gonna open it up as well so other people can submit their own templates as well and then there's like a ref share model and everything so it's really interesting because for us it's um you, actually, it's really funny, got here. you said that because a lot of teachers, and especially at Web Summit Qatar, when we won the pitch competition where we were number one out of a thousand startups, I had teachers walk up to me and they were like, this is Kahoot on steroids. This <laughs> is and I was like, you know, I mean, I am a huge fan of Kahoot and I am a huge fan of Canva. And one of the benefits of being a founder that builds on the shoulders of giants like that is that you're able to, you know, really, really leverage that momentum. We know that people realize the power of video games. We know that people are hungry to make their own games, but they're very expensive 
complicated and time consuming to build. So we were like, you know what, let's just break the time skills and cost barriers of making games and empower the next hundred million people so they can tell their stories through games. Yeah, and so they can learn useful skills. Uh, I know that sometimes when you want to be really excellent at something, you have to, uh, the, the Chinese have, um, the Chinese lore has a quite interesting wording to say that they say, eat bitter. Like you have to, <laughs> there's a point be, uh, beyond which if you want to, to attain a certain level, you have to eat bitter and to, yeah. uh, and to do a very painful grind and uh, something that is not immediately rewarding. That's, uh, that's interesting, but at least for the fun part and, the fir and for the, the complicated um, first steps that motivate you to see what the, the discipline is about, Uh, the field is about that that would be lovely indeed and so do you think there's uh, also a market for that in the in the um, still uh, prolific world of uh, indie gaming for example let's say i want to make an rpg that is totally not ed educational something just for you know to, to express my my internal universe which could be rich depending on the person but i'm not a coder for example i don't like doing that and i don't have the budget to hire uh, 15 people in order to to program a phys physics engine or something what can i do with that a hundred percent so there's a couple of things got here is um first of all if you look at the gaming world there's a lot of low code tools that are built for game developers, right? So there's BuildBox, Unreal Engine, Unity. It's like Bond.io. I mean, even to a certain extent, you can even consider Roblox, right? And everything to that extent of being like, hey, if you already have a knack for game development, you want, you have hours, but you just don't have the coding knowledge, then here's like, you know, a basics. And even then you are interacting with code, right? Like there's some code to it and everything we realize that there's a there's a huge gap so like if you look at the gaming world it's moving more towards the high end hey like you know i mean the mmorpgs the open world the ar vr games but if you look at the most um, um most common most famous genre of games it's still hyper casual games it's a billion dollar industry people are playing these these small games and actually yes, snackable content like tiktok is is on people's mind right now. This is the generation of bite-sized snackable content. They want fast, they want to go in, they want to play it and they want to leave, right? And everything. So what we decided was that just like you can't build a Netflix documentary on TikTok, you will not be able to build a AAA game on Brashna, but you will be able to make a lot of hyper-casual games that are at the moment relatively basic. So we're almost at the lowest hanging fruit, the lowest denominator of just very hyper casual games that you can create. And it's not just for game developers. That's the fun thing. If it's if anything, a lot of our a lot of our users, we have 175,000 registered game makers that have made over 160,000 video games on the platform that have the more than 2 million game plays, right? And most of these people are actually non tech and non gamers. It is the people like, you know, it's the teacher in South Africa. It's the mother in Pakistan trying to make a game about healthy eating. It's the, it's the, it's the teenager in Europe making a prom proposal game or like a sports trivia game, right? And everything. So it's really this idea of very fast, hyper casual games. It's the business owners that are making marketing games and then disseminating them through social media. So that's kind of that sweet spot where we are, the user persona of like flat learning curve, lightning fast, no coding at all. Hmm, wonderful. So this brings us to uh, the question of uh, Web3. How, so Web3, the blockchain industry, cryptocurrencies, all the decentralized and distributed systems. Basically, how did you come in contact with this industry and how do you implement that at Breshna or in your other companies? Yeah, so it's really interesting, Gautier. When we started building Breshna, it was a complete Web2 play, right? We were, if anything, we were Web3, skeptical of Web3, right? We were like, I don't know what's going on, but I mean, sounds like a little crazy. I don't want my users to get overwhelmed. You know, I mean, things were really not user friendly, especially in the early days and everything. So I was like, I don't know what's going on. But when you're in gaming, ownership, monetization, you know, these things are almost like built into rewards. These things are built into games from the from the old days, right? I mean, if, if you think about it, CryptoKitties, 
um, was one of the first, um, you know, deployments of NFT technology. And that was a game and everything, right? So it's like, so we, we basically were like, okay, there's something here, but we were very skeptical. But we started getting approached by Web3 investors. So we were raising our, our seed round where we actually raised $2.5 million from investors like Paris Hilton, Randy Zuckerberg, Bill Acton's family office, like a bunch of really cool Web2 and Web3 investors. And our Web3 Lovely. investors were like, hey, you know what? Like, let's launch a token. Like the market is hot right now. You can do equity, but like, you know, I mean, it'll be so cool to also have a token and everything. And I'm an economist by academic training. I spent, you know, 12 years working at the World Bank. And I mean, it, it, like I am very hardcore. I understand the supply and demand of currency as my academic profession, right? And I think I was seeing so many Web3 games or just Web3 projects that were launching. And I think what they had got here was token market fit. And they kept confusing it with product market fit. Ah. Uh, you know what I mean? Yes, there's absolutely. A, there's a demand for their token, but it's by speculative investors. It's by speculative traders. Their user persona is speculative traders. It is not the underlying utility of, for instance, for Web3 games, players or game makers, right? So like a lot of these Web3 games, the users that they had were not there for the product. They were there for the token, mm -hmm. right? And I wanted to make sure that when we launched the product, we could establish product market fit without any noise of a token or any other thing, because it's just like, then you're not able to tell who came for what reason. Because you, I mean, the ulterior motives are hidden, right? And everything, then you're like, who's in my, who's in my, who's on my platform and why are you here? So I think for me, I just wanted to keep it so pure, almost, almost to a totalitarian approach where we were like, we're not going to take any other noise, except I just want people who want to build games. And I want to know why they want to build these games. Where are they using them? Just like you were saying, like, is it, is it an indie developer? Is it a teacher? Is it a, is it a small business? Like, who are these people that want to build games? So all throughout 2022 and 2023, we resisted the pressure of launching a token and we established product market fit. Like we were like, who are our user personas and what do they want? Now the, Sorry, go ahead. Do you have a question? No, 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 no. I'm listening to you. That's, uh, that's fascinating. Keep going. It's re it really is, right? And then when we, when we establish product market fit, so now we have this no-code game maker platform and we built it and people are making games. But then our users started asking us, hey, so I make one math game on Rational. That's cool. It's a URL link. I can put it on my website. I can put it on WhatsApp. I can take it wherever I want. But actually, I've made 10 games on Rashna. And I want one place to be able to showcase these games. And I also want to make money on them, right? Okay, okay. So we were like, okay, that's interesting. What about if we built you a 3D virtual carnival, like a metaverse, where you would have your own carnival stands, just like a festival, a carnival that you go to. Yeah, a booth. You go to people's game, game stands. So got here, if you've made 10 Web3 games on Rashna, you can have your own carnival stand where you display these games and you have your community come to your 3D virtual immersive carnival stand. And that's where they play your 2D games in the 3D environment. And that's where you're able to say, hey, Mariam, the first game's for free, but then the second game is two Brashna tokens. And then the third game is five Brashna tokens because if you unlock level five, you get this, this reward or this discount and everything, right? So this idea of monetization showcasing and ownership started to come up and we could do it through fiat but our users are actually our top five countries are pakistan us saudi nigeria and indonesia now saudi nigeria and indonesia a lot of our users are unbanked if they make five dollars in the in Breshna and then end up spending 25 dollars in western union to to transfer that five dollars it's not working. Fiat is broken. So we ended up moving into Web3 because <laughs> Web3 was the thing that made sense, not because it was like, we're a Web3 company. Now let's figure out why we're using Web3, but actually because our users asked for us. 
Wow, that's lovely. So, uh, f first of all, thank you. I have little butterflies in my heart when I hear you speak about that because um, not only about the gaming industry, but that's something that is sometimes very pain painful. Anyone who's been working in the Web3 industry for more than a year has been to a convention, and that person will always have the very painful feeling that most projects are, are just people blowing wind into a money bag trying to, to draw attention from the investors. And it's actually very painful because there's really no re real reason to to invest in these projects. Most of the time, the, the life of a, of a Web3 scam entrepreneur, if, uh, so to speak, is just to just, you know, tickle the, the sweet spot of the investor and tell that investor that the FOMO is coming and that, you know, you should invest in that because it's going to be the next trend and you don't even know what it's about. So yeah. there, there will always be one uh, nouveau riche, a guy who's basically uh, uh, a person who's earned recently money and that or a VC that has one spare project to, to, you know, to just waste on something risky, one spare investment to waste on something risky. So there will always be some kind of, uh, of investment coming here, but that's always going to be pointless. And so many companies are just using the, world, uh, the word Web3 without actually selling anything that is, that is solid for users. So I'm really happy to hear that. And I'm, I'm fascinating to see that here again, the, the Web3 industry can help people who are unbanked or who are facing a bureaucratic nightmare or a, a, currency, a currency issue to basically it can help many honest people um, when they want to make a living because the, the banking system is flawed in, uh, in a way Web3 isn't. So thank you so much for that. A hundred percent. And I actually think I'll hear what you were saying. I feel like there was a shift, like, you know, the last bull market was all like, noise 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 how many twitter followers do you have how many people in your discord hustle hustle grind grind token 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 pump pump and then rock pull right Stops. i mean it's like it was like one template everyone just followed it and i actually think the bear market was a very good thing that happened for the web3 world <laughs> i mean i know a lot of us lost a lot of money and it was very painful but i actually think it was the growing pains. It was those teething issues that you have to go through because I actually think a lot of noise went away and then the builders stayed, right? Like if you look, if you look at, look back at 2023, a lot of the events were very subdued, but when you went there, people were no longer talking about pump, pump, pump. They were talking about utility. They were talking about blockchain technology, about what are the things that they're using blockchain technology for. And I actually... I mean, we're about to launch our Brushniverse and our token in the summer, and we're doing a pre-sale right now and everything. And it's really interesting because there's a special kind of, I think as a founder, we get very hungry about chasing yeses. Like, hey, are you going to say yes to my project? Are you, Mr. Investor, going to say yes to my project? But I actually think the real skill is the ability to say no. It's what you were saying, that that new money that money, like cheap capital, there's a lot of cheap capital out there. And you have to be very selective about who you let on this journey. Because if you're building a sustainable company, not a sustainable token, not a sustainable, if you're building a sustainable company, then you're going to need the right kind of partners on your journey. So I've actually started saying no in a lot of places, no to a lot of money. Because you need to understand that if you're, if the values are not aligned, if their motives are not aligned, then they're going to pressure you into doing that pump, pump, pump so that there's a dump. Like, I mean, you know, obviously at every pump is followed by a dump. So I think like for me, it's really important to know what kind of people join your journey. And now with this new bull market, I'm really hoping that we have a better quality pool of people, builders and investors within Web3. That's wonderful. So, so I love it because the, the take that the bear market is actually a good thing is interesting because every system needs sometimes some kind of self-regulation mechanics. And now that you mention it, it's interesting because the last two, three conventions I've been to were really different and uh, we didn't have so many people, you know, chasing the, the dream of making a quick buck. Um so uh, th th that's really, really uh, an enriching perspective. 
uh, that's qu uh, quite interesting to see that. And so, is there more uh, about Web3? Is there more that could be implemented, in your opinion, for you know regular businesses, some uh, businesses that are basically Web2 businesses on, uh, on steroids? Or are there other use cases that Web3 could bring in order to really reinforce the, the trust in this industry and to basically draw more users to, to Web3 in general? What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, 100% got here. I, I actually feel like, one, I think this idea, another myth that I think we need to bust is this idea of Web2 and Web3. Like it's some border, some country border that you need to cross where now you are in Web2 and now you're all of a sudden in Web3. I actually think it's a very porous, it's a very a fluid, um, you know, it's, it's not binary. It's a very fluid kind of scale where you can be like a Web2 company, but you can be like a Web2.1, 2.2, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2 Web3, right? And everything. Like I think that journey into Web3 is really about how much of blockchain technology are you leveraging? Mm. And I think when a business wants to ask, do I want to use Web3 technology? I think there's two questions that they probably want to consider is one, what is it going to do for my user journey? And number two, does it make a business case, right? So I think what's really interesting, like if you think about it, Gautier, I feel like Web3 technology has become all about um, like go shiny acronyms and jargon. And you have, you're like very cool if you're like, you know, using all of these, like, you know, I mean, all of these acronyms and all of these these terminologies. And I actually think like if you click, let's take for example, cloud technology. Now your user does not care at all which cloud you're hosting on. They've never asked you, is it Azure, is it AWS, is it IBM? Like, where is it? How does it work? Under the hood, under the hood of the car, they don't care as long as the engine works and as long as it gets them from place A to place B, that's what they care about. Same case applies for blockchain technology, for Web3. They don't care what chain you're building on. They don't care what, what wallet you have. They don't care what swap. They don't care. Those are not the things they care about. True, true Web2 users care about transparency. They care about ownership. They care about efficiency. They care about saving money, right? So if blockchain technology can allow them to own their content, like for instance, in, in Brush now, we, uh, blockchain technology allows our game makers to own their games, to monetize their games, to take their games out of the Brushniverse, to take the value that they've made in Brushna out of the Brushniverse and take it with them, with that ownership and monetization and that decentralization, that's what matters. The transparency, the accountability matters. So I really do believe that when businesses are thinking about blockchain technology, Often they'll go at it from the other, they'll be like, this is the cool thing to do. So now I need to be Web3 uh, company because everyone's throwing money at Web3 companies. But I actually, and same is the case with AI, actually. Like I think AI, now everyone is building AI for the heck of building AI. Everyone was building Web3 for the heck of building Web3. And I actually think the user journey at the end of the day, does it make your user's life easier, cheaper, faster what is happening to your user journey and if the answer to that is yes and if there's a business case then 100 percent, i think web3 has a lot to offer that's wonderful okay so basically you are focusing on the real experience of the end users and not only on, on these people so so breshna is not only kahoot on steroids because uh, your business model is quite is also quite different because of the implementation of web3 so how does a company in the in your field um how do you guys make money while uh, allowing all the others to to earn their own money? Because if this is Web3, you're not, I assume you are not taking a commission. You didn't create a custom token. You didn't fall into all the, the, the traps that uh, th that anyone can fall, <laughs> can fall in. So how did you, how did you manage to do that? I think, Gautier, it's very interesting. Like Web2 and Web3 business models can have a lot of overlaps, right? And everything, because I think with Web3, the only business model is always token accrual. They're like, we're going to launch a token and then the token price is going to go up and our treasury is going to go up and that's how we're going to make money. And that's actually a very bad, wrong answer. You know, it's like, I mean, that's that's probably not the best behavior. But, okay, so if you look at it on our beat, on our like 
on our revenue streams, we have premium subscriptions. So just like Canva, right? Like you can go make a game on Brashna for free, but if you want really cool avatars, if you want AI generated artwork, if you want really cool data insights into who's using your game and all of that, all of these premium features, it's, it's a premium subscription model, right? And everything. Then you have immersive advertisements within the Brashnaverse. So now you have this virtual carnival, this fully blown like, you know, festival where people are coming in, they're playing games. So you have all of these, you can have the Ferris wheel, the cotton candy machine, all of those where you can have your immersive advertisements. And then obviously you have digital land sales. So within the metaverse, you are buying carnival stands, you're making them bigger. Think about it almost like SimCity, like, you know, like, I mean, Tycoon Carnival, you're just building your own, um, your own carnival stands. And the bigger you make them, the more people come to your stand and the algorithm, like, you know, rewards engagement with engagement, like it does. So those are revenue streams that could be web two or web three, wherever you put them. But what we're saying is within the Brashnaverse and the whole Brashna ecosystem, you have a Brashna coin. Okay. This is an off chain coin. This is just like any, it's like Robux money. Anyone else who does any transactions, you know, it's like, I mean, any gaming, most gaming worlds have their own currency. So we have a Brashna coin. And you can do all of these things with the Brashna coin. So you can subscribe with your Brashna coin. You can like, you know, it's like do advertisements with your Brashna coin and all of that. And that Brashna coin can be bought through fiat and blockchain currency, right? So you have fiat and crypto payment mechanisms. You can do both of those. And then once the Brashna coin launches, it is mirrored with a Brashna token, right? So there is a Brashna currency. There is an on-chain token that does mirror it because we want the people to be able to, if you're making money in Prashna, then you can extract it using the Prashna token. So I actually feel there's some thought that needs to go into it in that value accrual that needs to happen from the token to your revenue and from your revenue back into the token. And so what do you think about this? Uh, okay, so the token trend is kind of um, going a bit down. So we can see that there are fewer people who are thinking, oh, let's make a dumb token just because, you know, basically it's an ETH token with uh, it's Ethereum, but it just has a different name and it's uh, a different Ethereum with a different marketing and that should be okay to earn some cash. So most people are not doing that anymore. Um, but still, there's a huge complexity in terms of chains and uh, people are putting their liquidity on one chain so one another. My personal conviction, um, my personal um, idea is that we'll probably have many, many uh, cross-chain payment solutions in the future because um, we're not going to see an Ethereum killer. We're not going to see one main chain dominating the market. We're going to see 5,000 of them. And just like there are different banks, there are cross-bank payments. There will be cross-chain payments. Uh, my question is, how do you think the... Um, uh, the market will evolve in terms of uh, of complexity. Do we uh, are we going to stay with something like twenty, thirty main big cryptocurrencies, maybe a hundred, or do we do we face a new rise in terms of complexity because there will be other things to take care of, um, new, new you know problematics, new uh, new use cases. What's your take on that? Yeah, hundred percent. So, Gautier, for our own use case, I think one of the things that was valuable to us was. Hey, um, when you're in games, a lot of people understand rewards. Web2, no matter wh where they are, like miles, points, rewards, these are things that most people understand. And in the gaming world, people do understand in-game coins, in-game currencies. I mean, from the back of the day, like any, any other game you pick up, you were doing like, you know, in-game currencies and coins. So that's why we did want to have something that, that the people could identify Again, a lot of our users are not Web3 users. They don't, they will be more intimidated if we're like, here's the Ethereum coin, here's the USDC, here's the USDT, here's all of this. Like that is way more intimidating to them than being like, here's your Brashna coin and here's your Brashna token. These you can exchange for each other. And then if you want to take it out, you can do that too, right? So it's almost like for us, it was that learning curve, like kind of hand holding them through it and almost like pointing them in that control direction as much as we could. Because like you're saying, this is going to evolve very fast. And before it evolves, before it becomes simple, it's going to be complicated, right? And everything. So we're just trying to protect our users and their learning journey as much as possible 
and keep it as flat as possible because once they dive into the Web3 world, it gets very intimidating and it gets very exclusionary. So for us, I think the big idea is, all right, at least while things are, sim are still like, you know, on that level of control, let's have the Prashna token, let's be able to monitor how we can communicate with them. But I 100% I agree with you. Eventually, there is a world where we're going to have many, many different mainstream tokens, coins, you know, mainstream chains, apps, dApps built on top of them and different kinds of, just like, just like the world, the fiat world right now, right? Like you have a lot of currencies, they have different values, they have different, different exchanges, but I hope that we're able to leapfrog all of the problems we have with fiat of decent of like centralization, very high transaction costs, the trust factor, and be able to go into a world where decentralization, efficiency, and and costs are optimized. That's interesting. So basically, you are smoothening the the edges, the rough edges, so that the, yeah, so that the user experience becomes easier to uh, to go through, and so that customers don't have to be super techies in order to to use your web three experience. Okay. Yes. We brought non-gamers into gaming and we're bringing non-Web3 people into Web3. And so for us, it's really important that we kind of like keep the scary monsters outside as long as possible before it's like, it's like letting your users off before they go flying off the nest. We want to keep it as secure and safe as possible. That's wonderful. It, it would have been ironic if you, uh, you guys had created a super platform with no code at all in order to, to create games. But sorry about that. Still, you have to be able to program a spot contract to get paid. Sorry, guys. Right? <laughs> it's like no code until you come to money. And then it's like, here's a steep learning curve. Yeah, so, yeah. that would have been complicated. Thank you so much, Mariam. I had a wonderful time in this interview. Any last word? No, just thank you so much for being game. I really appreciate you listening to me, you making the time. And, and I think anyone who wants to reach out to us, we're on Twitter, on Telegram, at Breshna Game, B-R-E-S-H-N-A-G-A-M-E. So, you know, happy to have a conversation as we gear up to launch both our token and the Breshnaverse. Dear listeners, you have just listened to the CEO of Breshna.io, Mariam Nasrat. You have heard all the relevant social media links to follow their work. So give them a little, pay them a little visit. And this was Mutual Knowledge Systems Podcast. Please like, share and subscribe. Yada, yada. See you next episode. Thanks, Mariam. Thank you so much, Gautier. I appreciate it.